speaker, Mr. John Phillips. John Phillips is originally from Mobile, Alabama. His family history is rooted in law, beginning with his great-grandfather, who served as a circuit judge of Mississippi. Mr. Phillips went on to follow the path of his grandfather and great-grandfather, choosing a career where he could be an advocate for those that needed his help the most. Mr. Phillips attended the University of Alabama, where he <coughs> earned a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and Criminal Justice in 1997, and his Juris Doctorate in 2000. In 2012, Phillips opened his private practice, the Law Offices of John M. Phillips. As an A.B. preeminent lit rated lawyer and one of the youngest board certified civil trial lawyers in the state of Florida, Mr. Phillips is considered an expert in civil law. He has received a number of awards for his work in the courtroom and in the community, including being named the Face of Justice by 904 Magazine. Yet tonight, you will realize John Phillips is more than a lawyer who appears on national news channels or syndicated radio shows offering legal advice. He's a leader who is driven by his compassion to help others. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Mr. John Phillips. Thank you. You get to a point where you hear introductions, you're like, is that me? Is that, is that, have I gotten that, that credential or that thing? Um, you know, ladies and gentlemen, when I come before, you know, when I'm at the, the ending of, of, of a case, a jury trial, I sit before groups not unlike this, you're very diverse, and I ask a series of questions. And my role is to find jurors who will be fair to my client and mainly to find those that, that, won't, be, that won't be biased. Uh, and there's a lot of questions that I ask and I, and I want to you know, really connect with jurors about their passions, about their, what they really love and what makes them tick. Because as we'll see as, as my speech goes through tonight, that's one of the most important things about leadership. If you're just calling it in, if you're just not passionate about what you're doing, you're not passionate about the role that you're going into, the rest might fall behind as well. You know, leadership isn't just CEO. It isn't just the title that goes after your name or under your name. It's what's right here and what's up here. So one of the first questions that I ask is, who here, that's what I ask a jury, who here considers themselves a leader? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw that one out there. Raise your hand if you consider yourselves a leader. I would hope so given that this is the Taylor Leadership Institute. What you see with juries and the, the average public is they don't put their hand up whether it's because of ego or you know, just being reserved. They just don't want to put their hand up and say, yes, I'm a leader. And so I go into the next question. I said, well, who here has a child? Who here has served in the military? Who here amongst us has been involved with their church or has been involved you know, who here manages a person? Who here has an administrative assistant? And all of a sudden, I got hands everywhere. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, you're all leaders. Who here has changed a tire for somebody? Who here has, you know, made a personal sacrifice that you didn't have to do? That's leadership material. So uh, we're going to go through, I've got two videos in about, you know, 35 minutes or as long as they, until they yank me off of here to talk to you guys about you, the leader. Um, Phil, if you will, let's start with my guy. Oops. This is not simulcasted at the Big Sean concert going on next door. I promise. But I want to introduce you to Colin Winter from Vancouver, British Columbia. Some of you may have seen this video. It was on a 
TED Talk, and there was a blogger before that that introduced us to, to Colin. Colin is maybe under the influence of something, maybe under the influence of life, but he's just having a blast. He's the lone wolf, the lone duck, the guy that's just not afraid to let it go. And then what happens? We have the first follower. And we're going to talk about the first follower. And, you know, watch as, as you watch this, watch how, you know, Tyler follows the first follower. And we're going to talk about which is the leader here. Is it, is it Tyler or is it the first follower? Or is it something entirely different? So people are still watching Tyler and his new friend. And in about three seconds, you're going to see a third follower. And this guy's turning it into a completely different dance, and that's perfectly okay. <laughs> and people are still sitting there. We've all been there. We've all been there where it's like, all right, these guys, what are they doing? And then something happens. And the, the dancer, Tyler, creates a movement. From the first follower to now you're sitting in the crowd feeling left out. That's leadership in its essence. It's having the courage to do something just completely out on your own because you're passionate about it <laughs> and watching others join. You, you get, we're gonna, the video cuts off here in a few seconds, but I assure you that entire mountaintop becomes a group that's dancing Tyler's dance. A leader is a leader because he or she has followers. Does that make sense? You can, be, you can be the most important person in the room and think that, that your idea is going to revolutionize science, biology, science, you know, whatever it is, copyright, you've got the best trademark idea in the world, but without a follower, without somebody to help you get to that end, you may not be a leader. As you saw with the mountain, risk reduces with the more people that came in. The stigma shifted from those that were sitting and watching to those that were active participants. That brings me, oh, and Tyler actually got some free swag. That was uh, the Sasquatch Music Festival, and he wound up going for years for free. So sometimes leadership just has has, has benefits, you know, of the tangible nature as well. So, you know, why is John Phillips up here talking about leadership? And, you know, I asked you to raise your hand if you consider yourselves a leader. And when Allison and the wonderful people here at the Taylor Leadership Institute came to me, I didn't have my hand up. This isn't, this isn't, the guy that's, that's standing on this stage has never really been comfortable on this stage. Um, never mind how many jury trials I've had, never mind, you know, you name the, the TV person I've probably been on with them, it's always awkward. And it's, it started, you know, in a situation where, you know, my dad was a nuclear power plant engineer, and I don't know if we have any army brats in the crowd, but you move around a lot. And so adjustment is tough, and kids are cruel. And so, you know, young John Phillips was always running around trying to find his own skin. And I wasn't worried about whether I was going to be class president. I was worried about how I was going to make it through day after day after day. And, you know, but for loving, you know, loving parents and, you know, a little bit of a sense of humor enough to get me out of bad situations, I, you know, I, I, I came into my own. But... You know, I wasn't the one who wanted leadership. I never ran for anything. It was, I've got a pretty good little core. I might have a little bit of the Sasquatch dancing guy in me, but I, I wasn't out there like he was. And so that took me, you know, to college where you guys are. And there's lots of different peer sets, peer issues, that you guys face. And it's, 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 hard, it's hard to stand out in a crowd. 
And again, going back to that question of passions and what 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 really gets you excited, you don't. In this country, you might can get to be president because you want to be president if you have the right power group. But to be a true leader, to tr be somebody that's really making a difference, you can't get it just because you want it. So, different cities trying to find my skin, my proper skin, um, and you know, I did come from generations of lawyers, and on the other side of my family, I had a dad that was an engineer that hated lawyers. And, you know, lawyers are the worst things in the world. I don't know of any more professions, any, any profession that has more jokes about it than, than lawyers. And as you go to law school, you learn them. They're, they're like, okay, what did the lawyer do when he went to the bar? Yeah. And it becomes a part of you know, kind of this, this, this perception. And, you know, as I, as I moved from Mobile to Jacksonville in 2001, you know, I started in a firm and I worked my way up in the firm. And, you know, I defined leadership as having people under me at that point. And it was, I was leading, but I didn't have, I, I didn't have any leadership. Um, you know, I was I was the captain of the ship, but I didn't really know where I was sailing. And you know, I defined it defined success by the time I got into work and the time that I left and what I was generally doing in that in that day. And a lot of people did. You know, that is there's 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 a ton of different ways to define leadership, but that didn't that didn't fit my skin. And so I took the offer I couldn't refuse from the, you know, the world's largest personal injury firm and said, okay, maybe this is it. You know, maybe it's being wanted by this group of people that would make me you know, feel like I can make a difference. Because if you're in this classroom, if you're in this, if you're in this auditorium, if you're in this minor program, you want to make a difference. People don't want to be leaders just to be leaders. I guess there are people that do, but I know from, from, from what I know about this program that people want to be here because they want to make a difference. And so I went to Morgan and Morgan thinking, personal injury firm, largest personal injury firm in the country, thinking maybe I can find a way I can make a difference. They represent more victims than anybody. And what I found myself doing is representing 500 people and I didn't know their first name. Um, I wasn't, again, I was moving in a direction, but I wasn't extremely comfortable with what I was doing or who I was with. And so that brings me to, you know, 2011. In 2011, um, I decided to go out on my own. I could start my own firm. We can figure this thing out. And immediately found out from um, my significant other that she was pregnant and hey by the way you jobless guy you got a baby coming and found out from my mother that she was ill and found out that I needed a surgery and that this firm you know and I weren't going to make it much further and so hey here's the pressure how do you deal with it and so like Sasquatch guy I was dancing I was doing my thing but I didn't really know what I was doing. And along came a couple of first followers that really made a difference for my life, made a difference for my career. One was a young lady named Erin Joint. Erin Joint was a Kansas tourist in Daytona, Florida. A lifeguard did a U-turn. Erin was, I think, the ninth woman run over on Florida beaches by lifeguards just operating F-250s and F-350s in the sand. And she had dozens and dozens of fractures, and nobody wanted her case because it was suing Volusia County, and she needed help. And she found me, and she said, oh, by the way, we got a date with Matt Lauer, um, if you want to go on the Today Show. And I said, hey, that'd be okay. Let me start this new firm with, a, with an appearance on the Today Show. That's fine. So, <laughs> you know, there's my first follow, and I had somebody that believed in me who I got to know her children, I got to know the situation, and you know, 
we advocated for her um, as, you know, not just as a lawyer, but as a friend. And there were a couple others along the way, um, but through Bennett, now he's born, uh, my first son, through Bennett, oh, and, and the other thing about Aaron Joint, that, that appearance on Matt Lauer would be the last time and the only time my mother saw me on national television. Um, and so within three months, I lost my mother and had her prophecy of my firstborn son um, that if, if any of you have children, you know the love of a parent. That there is no love, you will not know love, you will not know selflessness, selflessness, you will not know it until you have it right there. And so here all of a sudden everything makes sense to me in some aspects and, and some that they're stripped out. And so, you know, with this love and loss, I get introduced to the Jordan Davis family. And I don't know how many of you, how many know who Jordan Davis is? Okay, about a third. Um, Jordan Davis, 17 year old kid, went to Wilson High School down the street. Um, great kid, great neighborhood, not that that should be relevant in this day and age, but it is. And Jordan had been girl shopping on Black Friday, November 23rd, and hanging out with his buddies. And they pulled up and get gas stations outside in Bay Meadows, and they were loud, the music was loud, and cars wouldn't park next to him until along came Michael Dunn. And Michael Dunn came from his son's wedding, he had had a couple of drinks. We don't know why Michael Dunn did what he did, got some suggestions, but Michael Dunn, the last words Jordan Davis heard were, you're not gonna talk to me like that. 45 year old white man shoots 17 year old black man, black kid, leaves the scene, doesn't call 911, doesn't call the police, doesn't tell anyone, left the kid to bleed out, which he did. He died without consequence to Jordan. He left the scene without consequence to Jordan Davis. And so I had seen this on the news, and I'm like, whoa, you know, I don't know if I can help this family. I don't know how, you know, what I do translates to this situation. Um, but I was asked to meet with them because Media was knocking on their door, they hadn't yet buried their son, and we were in a society, we were in a situation where they needed a shield. And so, you know, without violating um, Lucia's trust, although she's been a wonderful spokesperson for her son, she's still parenting her son, but I, I sat in the living room, you know, as a lawyer, as a, as a guy that, you know, all these jokes are about, and and cried for the first time with a client. Having never known the loss of a child, but having known the birth of a child and known the loss of my mother, who was my best friend, something changed with me that day. And so, you know, call it what you will, whether, whether leadership found me that day, or I found leadership, or I finally had that first follower that sent me dancing way faster, way more crazy than this guy, there was something that happened. And so, you know, the first thing we did was try to challenge the defamation that was going on, that Jordan was a gang member, and, you know, playing, playing stereotype 101, um, because Daniel Brown, you know, wanted you to do that. You have to have fear to shoot self-defense even though he never called the cops so you know, there was no standing around legally but you know in, in the court of public opinion it was. so with that you know as as a as a white guy from from Alabama who went to the University of Alabama you know I learned things that, that and went places that I never I challenged myself um, and the situations challenged me and, and you know, you, you, when you're passionate about something, like, like I was telling Jordan's story, still am, um, you know, you find your voice, your leadership voice. And so, you know, we found, we found that, and, you know, God bless my wife, um, you know, she, she's, she's stuck through, 
she stuck through some some tough times. You know that that we've we've had some death threats. We've had some things that that really, for a, a, a lawyer, you shouldn't get. We're in a civilized society. We shouldn't have that issue. We shouldn't be challenged just because I want to lead for a family. Um, but but we did, and so um, you know. Years went by, we, you know, two, two court cases. Michael Dunn was originally acquitted for Jordan Davis's death. The other guys were, uh, the, the, the three boys that were in the car, they, they weren't armed, but Michael Dunn was committed, convicted for the, con, the attempted murder of those boys. Because Michael Dunn got out of his car and fired um, seven rounds out. And, but not about Jordan. You know, there was the question of, of you know, justice for Jordan. So, you know, through that and other cases that have come along, you know, it's, it's I don't know, again, if you ask me if I'm the leader that, that should be speaking at one of these, I don't know that I put my hand up. Um, you know, how do you define it? Do you define it? Because, you know, there's been documentaries about me and my cases. Do you define it? Because we've gotten awards. Do you define it, you know, by the material things or the little things that go on a CD? Or do you define it by your heart? And that's, you know, that's, that's the one thing that I thought that I could add is, you know, especially to a generation that I feel like I'm not that far removed from, and then I look at my birth certificate and realize, <laughs> right, and realize that, that you know, the, the, the millennial generation gets a bad rap. And, you know, they, the, the, What's going on with social media? You know, it is rewiring us. It is reprogramming us. Um, but this is a passionate generation. This is a progressive generation. This is this is a generation that gets it way more than 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 mine did. And that's what it's going to take um, to move you know to move this country forward. So you know, here I am. Um, trying to find my voice, trying to figure out what I can do uh, to make myself better, to make my city better, to make my state better, to make my country better, to give my child a, a better life than I had. And so we've taken on more causes, you know, cases slash causes. Um, and, and, you know, I talk occasionally about leadership, except I don't call it leadership. I call it everyday heroes, um, and, and people sometimes will say that that's different. You know, a hero. We all agree, a hero is a leader in most instances, but I don't understand how those things coincide. I said, "No, wait a minute. Let's strip it down." An everyday hero, and I'm not talking about um, you know our military heroes who are it, literally everyday heroes. I'm talking about that that guy, and we represented a bunch of them who it's 2 o'clock in the morning, he hadn't been drinking, but he sees somebody on the side of the road with a flat tire who has, and he goes to change the tire and he gets hit. Literally knocks, almost knocks his foot off. I'm talking about the guy who's legally blind, who unbeknownst to him, on his state ID card, his driver's license, except he can't drive, but his state ID card, they print a code section that labels him as a sexual offender. Happened over 200 times in the state of Florida. Completely incorrect. It last happened, it took two, two clients of mine before we get the, get the situation changed. It also happened to a mother of three in Orlando, and she actually had a sexual predator tied on her license in all capital letters, simply wanting to be an organ donor. Oops, the box was worth that close apart. Now she should have seen it, uh, and Mr. Flaherty couldn't have seen it. It took us, uh, what, Phil, two years, three years, two and a half years to get the DMV statewide to even change that system. So that these two things are far apart or that there was some sort of checkbox. Because that's the worst thing you can call a person. And so you have everyday heroes that Mr. Flaherty he passed away during the pendency of this, wouldn't have called himself a leader, but he made this world a better place. He made you guys safer. If you go get a renewal, you might not have the same faith that he had. 
And so, you know, I, I spoke to Jordan Davis Day in the, 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 the anniversary of, of what happened to him. And, and, you know, Tommy Storms, the driver of the vehicle, if any of you know the case, Tommy, Tommy, everybody looked at Tommy because he was the, you know, he was the one behind the wheel and, and did he leave the scene and did he go too far, you know, even though he went to the next parking lot. You know, and what was Tommy doing? What was Tommy thinking? And oh, you know, a 19 year old was going to get cigarettes. Let's, let's scandalize that. And I called Tommy on stage. I said, Tommy, come up here. And you know, 19 years old, just as, as sweet as could be. And I'm like, Tommy, there's an expression for why you are, and it's an everyday hero. And you. You blame yourself for Jordan Davis, and I know from Ron, and I know from Lucy. You should, you should thank yourself. You should take a moment to accept the fact you saved your life and two others that day. Because Michael Dunn would have killed all four of you, and that's what he was trying to do. And so, you know, you look at that aspect of things, and the everyday hero aspect of leadership, and again. Tommy came from a place of passion. He wanted to get out of there. He wanted to save his friends. It was also a fight or flight. But, you know, Andrew Flaherty came to me and said, other law firms want to take my case. It's a small case. You know, my driver's license had this wrong number on it. But will you help me? And I said, we, how, how many times has this happened? They wouldn't even give us a straight answer. And so, you know, bird eyes, hit and runs. The hard, the hard cases you know, oftentimes have the most compelling facts that can really, you know, not just change one person's lives, but, you know, change several. Are you doing that? Um, so, it's, you know, that's, that's, that's the everyday hero aspect of it. Um, you know, and, and a couple of people brought it up on the, you know, on the way here. If you follow my Facebook page, and you should, uh, lost John Phillips, uh, or John Phillips on Twitter, but, but it, it, you know, yesterday, I mean, talk about everyday heroes, talk about heroes every day, but yesterday, um, you know, I woke up, walked out to go to work, everything's normal, and not one, but both of my cars had been stolen. Yes. And so I'm like, now who's punking me? Where's, where's this going? And I didn't, you know, I was like, both? Like, both? This is personal? Like, really? <laughs> and so, I, you know, I called the insurance, I called my own one, I called the insurance company, I talked to my neighbors, you know, I just derail my day, rescheduled my appointments, and I try to figure out the riddle of who took my cars. And so, you know, oh, guess what? Your SLA didn't have OnStar, see ya. You'll never get it back. Well, one thing about my Escalade, and it's, it was in that 904 Faces of Justice thing, it's a picture of me in the back of my Escalade. And it's a weird picture to take, but the reason we did it is because my tax is Justice, J-U-S-T-I-C-E. Somehow I hit the lottery and got it. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm like, so you mean to tell me there's a thief in Jacksonville running around with an Escalade with justice written on the back, and he thinks he's going to get away. So, um, so you know, they also took my BMW, which was like my the first thing. You know, when you finally get a job and you finally just get that little bit of coin, just that little bit, you buy something nice. And this was my something nice. And you know, it was my first case, and it was my baby, and and you know. Had no material things, but that was like my, that was something. And so I'm like, you took my baby, you took my Justice Mobile. <laughs> so, um, I didn't know the BMW has track. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, the, the sales rep from BMW actually told me this, and I was like, I appreciate that, because you probably could have not told me, and you probably had another sale. And, Interest check came in. But so me and JSO and Phil um, and you know a couple other friends kind of went on a little hunt yesterday. 
And there was a point where we were at a stoplight, and I had, I had interviewed the, we got a ping at a BP station, and, and I went and interviewed the guy, you know, the guy was going to solve my own cry. Um, I'm good, but not as good as JSO. And, and so, you know, he was like, I'll have to have you talk to my manager. I'm like, yo, you do that. And uh, I'm going to get back and go look at him. And so I just kept feeling like we were going to pass, pass this guy. And we didn't, and we didn't, and we didn't. And I was on my last pass. I go pick up my kid, meet my wife, have dinner, be normal, forget this bad, forget this. You know, I, I, I'm the silver lining guy, if you can't tell. I'm trying to find it on every cloud. I'm like, all right, I'm going to let JSO do their thing. We keep passing cops all over the place. And two cop cars in front of us dart to the right. And I couldn't make the turn. I wasn't going to yeah, do it. So we did a turn. And as I'm about to pull back into that driveway, a friend of mine who's a private investigator said they had the car. I said, what? Eight hours after this thing's report stolen, you been there four hours, I think, for that one. Um, no way. I've heard hard that thieves aren't caught. They have the car. And so the, the beam there's a hard top convertible. And I pull up top down. <laughs> top down. Music player. Uh, I'm pretty sure it wasn't a song that I had left it on. <laughs> and but you know, it could have worked it. And so um, so the one guy, I should have had you cure the pictures. I knew I'd tell the story. It's too, it's too, too soon. And you know, the one guy named Dirty Tony is you know 400 pounds, and he literally told the officers, according to what the officers told me, that he had traded my car in for fifty dollars in crack. What? I was like fifty dollars. Come on. So. Um, the other guy was in the back of the police car, and they said, we really want you to meet the officer who made the arrest. We really want you to meet the officer. I said, I'd love to meet the officer. Yeah, she pulled over these two enormous guys, and she, you know, she became, like, my hero. She was not just my everyday hero. You know, yeah, it's, it's, it's not just property, it's the invasion. I had a client once who, who had his house ransacked. And he said, John, I want to go back to that house. I'm like, yeah. And so I was like, why not? He's like, you know, there's the story of the bird who's had the human hand in it. He doesn't want to go back to that nest. And so this is, this is, this is Officer Abby. This is me yesterday. Uh, a little more casual because I was just driving around. And she pulled over these two guys, fearless. Fears, and that is an everyday hero. And you know, I posted about her, raved about her. Her mom's posted on my Facebook page. Her dad's posted on my Facebook page. You know, and that's all it takes sometimes to spark that passion. To spark that she's doing this not because of the money she makes or the car she drives in. She's doing it because she loves it. And that's the challenge for everyone. And so. You know, I want to get into one more quick story. Oh, thanks, Bill. And it's Army Captain, I want to make sure I get the names right, William Swenson. Captain Swenson and First Class Kenneth Westbrook were protecting our Afghanistan war. They were teaching the natives of Afghanistan how to fend off the Taliban, how to fend off those that wanted to destroy their government. And Captain Swenson, and, and I don't know if we're going to play the audio version or not, but there's gunfire everywhere. This is a bad scene. They got ambushed, and things were going really, really bad. Go ahead and hit it, please. So you're going to see Captain Swenson and the, the gentleman they're carrying this Sergeant First Class Kenny Westbrook. 
hills of Afghanistan. Swenson somehow sandwiched, you know, with my little bit in there might have something that can infect you, make you realize that that if you want to be a leader, you got to find a source of passion, and you've got to find people that will support that. You won't see me barking around. Maybe you will. Don't talk to you. You won't see me barking around my office like a Supreme Command. You will see acts like that. We encourage everybody, you know, there's the, the big Aristotle, Shaquille O'Neal, was terrible at pretty much everything except what he was really, really, really good at. You know, free throws, mm, uh, dribbling down the court. Mm. But when, when you put him in position to score, scored heavily. And that's that's the team approach of leadership. Shaquille O'Neal, you know, wasn't just the CEO of the basketball court. He needed everybody else to be there. And he needed, you know, he needed those guys to be there night after night, passion after passion. So, you know, as I close, um, you know, I'm happy to take any questions you have. Just Remember that leadership doesn't always come from the book. This will get you, this, this, this education will get you moving down that way. It will. And the fact you're sitting here, the fact you're coming to classes, the fact that you're making a difference for yourself future down the road is really, really significant. And, you know, if you got questions about law school, you got questions about stuff like that, people can answer those questions. They can answer how to get to the to the end. But you've got to find something that you're passionate about, you've got to find something that you love, and you've got to find people that will support you and dance with you no matter how crazy you're dancing. Thank you very much. We have two microphones here, but they're not turned on. Uh, hey, how's it going, Mr. Phillip? My name is Monterey Phillips, so we've got something coming already. 
Um, quick question. Would you, would you agree that being the emotional leader is the new leadership of the 21st century? You got to start there. It, you know, it's, and, and, and it's, you know, you, you can get me going off right here, right now, more time than we have about the frustration I have with, with, our, with, our, with our presidential races, with our governor's races. You know, we've got people that want that CEO label, but really aren't an emotional leader, leader aren't. They? They're not, they're not, you know, JFK, MLK, you know, they, Abraham Lincoln, there's, 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 I mean, even present day, there's people that can, that can grab the heart and understand that we've got some issues we've got to get through. I'm giving a TED talk about it, you know, in a couple of weeks about equality and, and things that we've got to get through that we can't just close put blinders on and say, oh, this doesn't exist. So I agree with you that, that there, we need some emotional leadership. We need, you know, we need to see more of that rather than just people barking at us telling us what their ideological, ideological beliefs are. C.C. Carter, and actually an information systems leader. And um, I want to know, I know that part of being a leader requires, it requires passion, compassion, bravery. And I know that you mentioned that you got death threats when you were working on the Jordan Davis case. And I was wondering if there was any point at which you decided, or you considered, just kind of, well, for yourself or your family? Yeah. There's, a, there's a documentary premiere in my family had to go, I mean, it's crazy. The road you take, if you, if you, if you believe, and you get on, you hold on. You know, we've been to Sundance, we've been to, we've been to Tribeca this year. There's, there's one about Jordan's life, there's one about Lucy's life that I have a little piece in. And it addresses that. And we got broken into three years ago. And I got my concealed weapons permit, and, you know, I let fear take over. And that doesn't mean that that's the same for everybody, but that's an emotional reaction. Um, for everybody why we have guns, but that's what it was for me. It was, I'm not going to let my family get harmed. It was an emotional reaction. And it certainly required a lot of prayer, a lot of guidance from my wife. You know, she, she decided when I was pushing the envelope too much and me and Davis is pulled back. You know, and said, wait a minute, this isn't the fight necessarily we want to be on. He is this, it does this get Jordan Davis justice? And, you know, right before the first trial, there was a tweet that came in. Police did nothing about it. So I, I mean, thank you for it. Said I would make it to the end trial. And followed up with, I better have a stash of cash laying around because if my kids go missing, you know, what am I to do? And I was sitting there saying, how, 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 can I, how can a guy who's just, just trying to do right, you know, I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to tell a story. And how can that put me in a situation where I'm in danger? And it's happened. And, you know, I fussed about the, the Klan being on the mural in Baker County, and, you know, got some whack from that. And it's, you know, for me, yesterday, you know, most people wouldn't go run into trouble to go to go find you find your justice maker. Which wound up, I, I, I didn't finish the story, it wound up smashed, like smash, smash. So we're going to have a new justice maker, we're going to tag, tag, and keep. So, um, you know, but it was, it was a sentimental moment because I, you know, I retired. I took the day, this is, I bought that to take them to court because I knew we were safe. You know, we had to have an armed guard to walk us to the courthouse. We're, we're in a case about the use of the reckless use of guns and, and us not understanding one another enough to have a conversation. And I gotta have an armed guard walk with me to the, the halls of justice. Does that seem right? So, you know, to answer your question, we've it's been a step-by-step -step process, um, but my wife God bless her. She's she's she understands. You know now it makes sense what you know, my grandfather and great grandfather were when they were in Mississippi in the 1930s and 1940s and went and drafted wills and things that really they weren't supposed to do. 
Maybe, maybe that apple didn't fall far from, from the tree. And I thought it did. I thought I was, you know, way different. So we can't live like that. Oh, uh, <laughs> hello, uh, my name is Vaughn Sayers. I'm a philosophy major here at UNF and a freshman. Um, and I guess my greatest question is I want to become a lawyer one day. Um, and my inspiration for that is there's a lot of injustice in this world. And I want to be a person to be there for people who don't have something, you know. Thank you. <laughs> um, but what is the greatest advice that you could give me right now at being a freshman here at UNF and any life advice from a person? You know, find passion. You know, I mean, and that's that's what I was saying about this generation is they, they are going to law school to make a difference. They're not going to law school to be Jerry McGuire, uh, which was a lot of what, you know, what the people that I was around. I went to law school, wanted to get a degree, having no idea where, you know, insurance defense, what is that? I don't know. I did it for eight years, you know? And, you know, not knowing that I would be led to this point. And so, education, 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 you know, and in finding, finding opportunities to, to volunteer, to get, you know, to get your hands dirty and make a difference is so important. Right? You know, we were talking about going to Selma. Um, you know, before this meeting, and just, just seeing it, feeling it, you know? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hello, my name is Bon Senior. I'm a senior in the pre law program, from the major, probably by the university. And I'd like to know if you have any tips on how to become a successful trial attorney. Again, you know, and it's, it's kind of the feathered part of my story. I don't know. You know, I, I guess I've done it, but, you know, I had a trial last month, and, you know, I still plan me, and, and, and you, you've got to find your voice. You know, speaking, public speaking is extremely important. Um, you know, I think I was a, a C or a C minus speech student, you know, my entire life, and I would clam up if ever, if ever, you know, presented with the opportunity. And it took, I don't know how many interviews I've had now, 100, 100, 200, and you know, eventually you get com more comfortable. And eventually you come up here and you know, do this without, without Marco Rubioing the water all the time. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Marco. <laughs> and uh, I love it. So it's, you know, it, it's just it's getting out there and doing it, interning, um, same kind of thing. You know, you, you, it's it, 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 it's just finding that passion. We have time for one more question. And it goes to your side. Hi, uh, my name is Marcus Blessing. I'm a mechanical engineering major here. Uh, one of the things you talked about at the beginning was you know, the leader is the guy who steps out and is willing to take the risk. But you also find a leader as needing his followers to Help him. And uh, one thing that I've found in a lot of the stuff that I do with engineering is that you have a lot of fundamental ideas, and you always have great, great ideas, but the biggest thing is, from, from a leadership standpoint, you need the business to back you. So, the, and, and that is huge in you know, making technolo technological changes in our world and making it the world a better place. So, from the standpoint of gaining followers, how would you say is the best, I mean, the strategy probably varies depending on what you're doing, but in terms of in really inspiring people to want to follow you, to want to bet it all on you and, and want you to do well, how do you inspire followers? It's a separate, it's an entirely separate speech. Uh, I'd be happy to have you, we can go to lunch and talk about it. But, you know, you, you, you don't sell people a thing. You sell people a passion. And there's a guy giving a TED Talk in Jacksonville this year who, engineering student, same kind of challenges. Now he, he's one of these guys with robotics in, in middle and high schools. And, and I'm looking forward to the talk to my city thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and fantastic guy. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. You know, it's, it's not something you can just say, hey, throw up a Facebook page and everybody's going to like it. Um, it, you know, but you've got to find an element, you've got to, you know, it's apples, apple, 
um, because they're not selling a product. They're selling, they're selling a concept that's bigger than that. It's best I got in like 45 seconds. Can I have one more Back. question? You one, one more question. question. Yeah, one more question. Who will go to a big shop? Mary Ann. Boys and Girls Club, you know, there's, there's, it's again, it's getting out there and finding, and I, and again, I'm, you know, I'm 40, I don't have a habit, but I turn 40, and, it, and I don't know what's, you know, what's out there, which appears to me, and, you know, it's, there are Jacksonville Police Athletic League, huge, there are, there are kids who are coming up without a role model of a college kid to look up to. And if you give them that, it's like them having me up here. You know, what do I know? But if you give, somebody in this room will take away something from what I said. And if you get with the groups like Boys and Girls Club and, and POW, you could be that star for somebody else. And, you know, that's, I'm going to say a ticket ahead of me. That's a, that's, a, that's a walkway to a better place if you're making a difference. Thank you, John Phillips. And just to answer a question. Ms. Allison here has just recently taken on a new position as Taylor Leadership Institute's Outreach Coordinator, which directly deals with Mariana's question of facilitating opportunities to give students venues to flex their leadership muscle, if you will, both on campus and on campus, off campus. But I've been asked to say that you all are invited to partake of some foods, but we're going to ask John to lead the way out into the lobby, where he's going to kind of lead his way first through the food line. And, and, and then you can continue the conversation with Mr. Phillips uh, out in the lobby. So thank you very, very much.